is Colin Kammerer, he's from Caltech. Uh, thanks a lot to be here. I suppose you are under jet lag, and uh, we appreciate the fact that you cross the Atlantic Ocean from uh, California. Uh, you have a good spring weather, so maybe yes, okay. <laughs> it's a compensation. So I'll, I'll leave you the floor. The title of your talk is uh, Neural Correlates of Risky Choice. Right, so once again, I've changed the title quite a lot. Um, thank you very much for... <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry, it, it's actually quite a different talk. I partly, as Peter said, to try to coordinate with him and talk about something um, uh, a little more uh, um, thematic. So thank you very much for arranging this. This has been a terrific day so far, and I'm very happy. Even though it would be nice to have a shorter trip, I'm very happy to have come. Um, so I'm interested, today I'll speak about the cognitive neuroscience of strategic thinking, mostly about cognitive, and just a little bit about some quite um, simple and very preliminary results subject to all the usual caveats from fMRI. So specifically, I'm gonna focus on strategic thinking which is reasoning about what others will believe, value, and choose. And I'm gonna draw a kind of coarse distinction between what's called equilibrium game theory, which assumes that players, either through introspection, maybe talking, uh, trial and error experience, or maybe formal uh, training, uh, come to correctly guess what other players will likely to do, and contrast that with an approach we call cognitive hierarchy, which is, in a sense, is a cognized version of something like rationalizability, as those of you who are experts will see. Okay, so um, the, the essence of the equilibrium concept, for which John Nash won the Nobel Prize in the 90s, uh, shared the Nobel Prize, is the two properties, which is first, that choices are optimal given beliefs. Uh, second, that beliefs about others' choices are accurate. And again, it, the, it's always been a little bit of a mystery in game theory about how this accuracy comes about, whether it comes through learning process or something like that, but it's just a mathematical thing, a fixed point theorem. Um, and uh, by the way, this, the optimality of choices can easily be relaxed and replaced with something like a soft max or um, um, stochastic choice process, and that results in something called quantum response equilibrium, which is widely studied in behavioral game theory too, particularly at Caltech and other places. Okay, in the cognitive hierarchy approach I'm gonna use, one can think of many variants of how to do this, and I'm just gonna hone in on one because we've applied it to lots of different types of data, but there's lots of interesting questions about general, generalizability of the structure. It is one in which um, you start somewhere in the hierarchy with what we call zero-step players. They're assumed to do something very system one and simple and heuristic. Probably they have much quicker response times, usually they do when we measure them. They're not thinking necessarily about another player, they're doing something very automatic and, and heuristic. It could be, say, randomizing across a set. It could be picking something that springs to mind, something that's in a geometrically focal location or something of that kind. In, in one interpretation by Vince Crawford, who's done a lot of research here, they're basically just a kind of like yeast, you know, in the bread. They're just, a, a, it might even be a figment of the other players' imaginations. That's just some way to begin an iterative process of reasoning. The K-step players guess accurately what the lower step players do, but they think they're the only uh, case step players. There's a kind of overconfidence or maybe non-self-awareness. So one step players think they're playing zero step players and then they optimize. Two step players think they're playing one and zero and optimize and so forth. And then as you'll see, there, there are lots of natural ways to truncate the hierarchy in some reasonable way. So the plan of my talk, first I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start from less neuro to more neuro with behavioral evidence from a bunch of interesting games just showing how this type of cognitive hierarchy approach might work and why we think it helps us explain some puzzles. I'll say quite a bit about eye tracking, a little bit about imaging, and some uh, more complicated things at the end. So behavioral evidence. The first game I'll start with, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start from easy to hard. By the end of the talk, we'll be doing what, what actually is quite complicated game theory. In this so-called beauty contest game, um, players choose a number from zero to 100. Everyone's doing this simultaneously. The closest to two-thirds of the average wins. It doesn't have to be two-thirds, but that number's been used in a lot of games. And um, what you'd like to do is to be, if you think of numbers going from zero to 100 as being low to high, you'd like to be lower than most people, but not too low, because you want to be two-thirds of the average, no lower, no higher. So there are a lot of experiments on this. Um, I'll start with one that we did in 1998 with uh, students in Singapore. and. Um, the way a lot of people think about this is to say, I'm not sure what the number will be. 
the average of numbers from 0 to 100 is 50, so I'll choose 33, which is here. But wait a minute. If everyone picks 33, I should pick 2 thirds of 33, which is 22, which is here. But wait, if everybody picks 222, I should choose 2 thirds of 22, which is around 15, which is here. And in equilibrium theory, this, iter this iterated process of reasoning doesn't stop until everyone is doing what they think everyone else thinks everyone else is doing and so forth, which in this game is at zero. That's the unique Nash equilibrium of this game, which happens to be on the boundary. So in this diagram um, from my paper with Ernst Fair and Science, reviewing lots of different studies, the equilibrium prediction is here. In a way, it's unfair to beat up on that prediction because it's so extreme, it can only be wrong. Um, and what you see in the data from Singapore is a series of spikes in the middle. There are some people who pick zero. They don't win. That's important too, right? So if you think of game theory advice is supposed to create value, picking zero is not the right answer to the question, how do I make money in this game? It is the right answer to the question, what's the national equilibrium? But those are two different things. It's also the right answer to the question, when the game is played over and over, what do numbers converge to? So it's, a, it's the right answer for something but not necessarily the best model of human behavior when people play for the first time. And they're also, when we run these games in large samples, you also get interesting quirks which are hard to account for by any parsimonious theory. Like there are a number of people who chose 80 and 88, which are dominated. You're never gonna win with those. Um, and that's because in uh, eight, the number eight um, is, uh, is um, superstitiously believed to be good luck in Chinese, and this was in Singapore. So it was not good luck <laughs> for them. Uh, so there are lots of quirks in these theories that you, you might need to add in very special properties. These are 8,000 observations pulled from three different newspaper and magazine contests where people had to write in, and the winning answer got to win some prize, like Financial Times, it was first class airplane tickets from London to New York. Um, and this is nice because these are average people, but well, not actually average people, the readers of these magazines were self-selecting. And you can see they show roughly a similar pattern to the students in Singapore. Okay, this is Reinhard Zelten, who um, um, shared the Nobel Prize also with Nash and, he said, and Harsanyi. He said that the natural way of looking at game situations is not based on circular concepts, but that he means this fixed point, that I'm optimizing given your choice, and your choice is the optimal one given my choice, but rather on a step-by-step -step reasoning procedure. And he had in mind, I think, something very much like this cognitive hierarchy. Okay, so to remind you, we need several pieces. There's a distribution of the steps of thinking f of k, the zero steps choose in some heuristic way. Ideally, that would be the same in every single game, but there are obvious reasons why it may not be. If you really think it's something heuristic, like a snap judgment or a system one, it could well vary across different games. It could be a lucky number in one game, and it could be an average in the other games. The K-step players think that others are below them. There are two flavors of this model. The one I'll talk about, we call CH, is that um, you take the actual distribution F of K and just truncate it, censor it at from k minus one to zero and then normalize so that the, the higher level players actually have the right model of the world. As they go higher and higher in reasoning, they're converging to the correct distribution. Another version is that everyone who's at level k thinks everyone is just one level below them. Uh, in different mathematical applications, some of these turn out to be easier or harder than others. What is f of k? Well, you could either estimate it parametrically. We did that in some early work or you can parametrize it. Um, we've found it very useful to use the Poisson distribution. First, it has a fancy French name. Second, uh, it's parametrized by a single parameter tau, which is the mean and the variance. So that's very handy if you're trying to do mathematical economics, you just have one parameter to study. Um, it also de derives from this property. If you, if you think of transitioning from k minus one steps of thinking to k, it's like sort of graduating you know, at a harder and harder university or school system then if f of k divided by f of k minus one is proportional to one over k, that is as you're going up this hierarchy, it's less and less likely you'll transition from one step to the next. That implies the Poisson distribution. And here's a graph of various values. A, a value we find useful in a lot of experiments is around one and a half in red. The uh, mode is at one step of reasoning. That is people are optimizing against a random distribution or a heuristic distribution. And the nice feature is that because of the mathematical structure, the Poisson drops off very, very rapidly with high steps of reasoning, which we think is something like working memory constraint or some kind of algorithmic computational constraint. Okay, now I'm gonna start very far from the brain in Sweden um, uh, and talk about a, a, a field, non-experimental field data set 
which just shows some of the interesting properties of this theory, and then I'll eventually hone back in. So this is a lottery ticket you could fill out um, in 2007 in Sweden. And in this special type of lottery, you choose a number from 1 to 99,999, an integer. The form is such that you can pick up to six different numbers if you'd like and fill, fill out the um, forms. The lowest unique number, that's why we call it loopy, lowest unique positive energy, loopy, wins 10,000 euros. On average, 53,000 people play it every day. There's a TV show, if we had more time, I would show you. There's a TV show that shows the numbers that were chosen starting from the top going down. It's actually quite uh, exciting because it stops at a certain number that's unique, and then, but you don't know if that's the lowest unique one that keeps going. And um, there's, a, there's some elegant game theory here that my collaborators did. It turns out it's, it's computationally impossible, at least with us in mo using modern computing, to solve for the mixed strategy in Asher equilibrium. The reason is the combinatorics of computing the unique numbers is extremely difficult. So with 50,000 players and 100,000 numbers, it's impossible to do. So we don't know what the Nash equilibrium is. But if you assume that the number of players is not the same every day, and that that distribution itself has a Poisson distribution, that is, it's an average of 53,000, but sometimes it's 60,000, sometimes 40,000, then the Poisson game is actually quite easy to compute. A little bit of math gets you this condition. This, this is a condition on the probability of choosing number k and number k plus 1. E shows up in here. It's just a coincidence this is Poisson again. It's like double Poisson. Um, and uh, simply proving that deriving the equilibrium is kind of an, a new contribution. Nobody had done this before, including the designers of the game. So here's some data from the first week, which is around 400,000 observations. First, this is the full distribution, 0 to 100,000. The Nash equilibrium is here in black. It basically predicts people should pick about up to from 1 to 5,000 about equally often. And then there's a very sharp kind of magical drop at 5,518. And then very few numbers should be chosen out here. Um, and the theory looks pretty good. So the, notice that the theory right away tells you that 95% of the numbers should rarely be chosen. And that's correct. However, if you zoom in on the lowest 10,000 numbers, which is we've done here, this is only the lowest 10% of the numbers. You can see that while the theory's on the right track, lower numbers are chosen more often than high ones. Very low numbers are chosen way too often. Medium numbers from 2,000 to 5,000, not often enough. This is the actual data, and this is Nash equilibrium, the Poisson Nash equilibrium. And then numbers that are higher are chosen too often. So this can't just be sampling error, right? It's very low numbers too often, very high numbers too often, medium numbers not quite enough. Okay, so we fit the cognitive hierarchy model I mentioned earlier assuming that the level zero player is purely randomized and assuming a softmax stochastic choice function rather than best response. And what we get is a fit of two point, uh, tau is 2.98, around three steps of reasoning on average, and that fits quite nicely. Specifically, it, it explains the key features of the data. Number one, the theory is not bad. It does predict a lot of low choices, and that's what you see. Number two, you get too many lows, not enough middle, and too many highs. Okay. Um, then we did some lab experiments. Because this, this game in Sweden is so simple, we can just play the same game in the lab with a few simplifications. The major one is that we don't have 53,000 people. Uh, that's 50 times the school at Caltech. Uh, we have 26 people, and they choose numbers from 1 to 99. Here the theory predicts this dotted line. It's kind of similar in shape. It predicts that only numbers from about 1 to 13 will ever be picked, and then the higher numbers won't be. And it reproduces basically the features of the data, but in a, a weak form. There's too many low numbers, not quite enough medium numbers, and then too many high numbers. Okay. If you're curious what happens over time, by week seven, that's, uh, that's uh, 49 days of play, with the number being announced on this TV show, um, the theory is starting to look pretty good. And the only real gap between the prediction and the theory, other than a lot of spikes, is in here. So I, I regard this as actually, Nash equilibrium is doing extremely well here in a very surprising way, and it makes a very bold counterintuitive prediction. Okay, um, eye tracking. So um, the first kind of real cognitive tool I'm now going to show you to think, to try to calibrate this cognitive hierarchy reasoning model, which seems to predict some field data modestly well, um, is eye tracking. This is the version we use. It's kind of an old crude, crude version mobile eye link we use at Caltech. It also records pupil dilation, which is useful as an omnibus measure of arousal sometimes. Uh, first thing is, this is a very typical pattern of looking. 
This is an unusual type of matrix. Those of you who are game theorists, this is a Stroop task, basically, because what we've done in this board is this is uh, player one is the person who's going to be eye tracked. They have to make one of four choices, row one, row two, row three, row four. So they're going to eventually choose one of these boxes. These are the paths they get if they choose this row and the other player, player two, chooses C1, C2, C3, C4. So that one player chooses a row, the other chooses a column. This is player one's payoffs. These are player two's paths. They're separated physically. So that in eye tracking, we can see if they're going back and forth and comparing. And the main style is fact you should see is that they're looking at their own payoffs quite a lot more often than the other player. In uh, the study I'm going to talk about in a minute, the um, difference is about 4,000 milliseconds versus 2,700. So remember, to compute Nash equilibrium, you need to look at your own payoffs and the other players' payoffs. And players are, are, a lot of times players barely look at the other players' payoffs at all, which is consistent with zero, level zero, and level one. So we can't say, oh, this is a level one player simply from these data, but it's consistent with what we get from that story. Okay, this is an older study of ours going back almost um, 15 years. This is a study on bargaining. I'll, I'll sketch it very quickly. Um, it's uh, based on what's called alternating offer three-stage three bargaining in this case. In the first stage, the players have $5 to split. Player one makes an offer to player two. Like, you get two, I get three. If player two says no, the amount shrinks to 250 and then player two gets to make a counter offer, alternating offer. If player one says no to player two's counter offer, it goes to a third stage, the money shrinks further. It's sometimes called shrinking pie or shrinking cake bargaining. And they have only $1.25 to divide. If that's rejected, there's no money at all. Okay? And the standard theory of this type of game, if players are purely self-interested and they're not concerned about fairness, is that you should look ahead to the third game, figure out what to offer, use that to, to, as an input to figuring out what player two will offer in the second round, and use that as an input to figuring out what you need to offer player two in round two, a process called backward induction or dynamic programming. Okay, so this is an icon graph. Well, first, let's look at the data. These are histograms of how much is offered. In this particular game, the subgame perfect solution is to offer $1.25. Because if player two is self-interested, she would see $1.25 is half of $2.50, and if I go to the last round, that's the most I could get. Um, so I should accept that. Um, what you see is that um, these players here, we call them zeros. You'll see why more in a second. These players here offer, this is a reverse graph. Here's a $1.25 on the left. That's the prediction of the self-interested equilibrium theory. Here's $2.50. That's an equal split. They offer an amount that's around $2. So there's somewhere between equal split and the equilibrium prediction. And what the icon graph shows you is how much they're looking at these three amounts. The three amounts were varied each time, so they can't remember that they have to look. The width of this icon graph is the number of times they looked at that box to see what was in it. The um, height of the blue part is the, is the normalized amount of looking time. And these arrows represent the normalized number of, of transitions or saccades back and forth between the boxes. So what these zeros are are people who look mostly at the first amount, less at the second, and less at the third. They're, not, they're literally not looking ahead, looking into the boxes that tell them what would happen if their offer was rejected. These are players who spontaneously actually look at the second amount more than the first, and they make a lot of transitions back and forth. They seem to be looking one step ahead. They're saying, if my offer is rejected, what happens next? And they offer much less, closer to the perfect equilibrium. These are players who actually um, play close to equilibrium, even though they're not that close, and they're looking at the third box a lot and making a lot of transitions from box three to box two when they're in the first round. Um, and then these are trained subjects. These are subjects who are given a couple of paragraphs of backward induction instructions. They're, they're just there to show that they, they can't, you can't actually compute this um, equilibrium solution if you, if, you need to, if you need to. So it's not that it's so computationally difficult. It's just somehow unnatural or inaccessible or system two. It requires a real leap of insight. Gee, I should, plan, I should look ahead. Okay. Here's a class of games that involve um, conflict of interest. And uh, these are sometimes called strategic information, information transmission games. There's probably a, ni a nice phrase in French. We might call it bullshit games in um, American. And um, these are, this is a wide class of games that's been used a lot in economics and political science. You'll see why in a minute. So um, a sender learns a true state. It may be, say, the value of a stock or the condition of a car they're selling. And it's an integer one to five. 
The sender then sends a message to the receiver. It might be, oh, this is worth four. The receiver gets the message but does not learn the true state. That's the key. So it's like going in for an operation or having your car worked on and saying, how sick am I? How much do I need to pay? How bad is this problem? How good is this stock? And the receiver then chooses an action A, which is, again, an integer. And the conflict of interest is that the receiver wants to choose an action which is equal to the state. They want to sort of know the truth and use it. The sender wants them to choose an action which is the state plus one. The state plus one. For example, the sender might want the, 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 a buyer to pay too much relative to true value. Okay. So you can think of lots of examples of this where people are exaggerating the truth in order to get you to go along with some program in politics or economics or academic politics and economics too. Okay. But keep in mind that this structure, as is typical in these game theory experiments in economics, this structure is not learned but is completely told to the subjects. So if, if the sender says to you, um, the state is five, you could say, wait a minute, that probably means the state is four, you added one on. But wait a minute, if you think that I'm doing that, the state's probably three, and you think I'm going to subtract one. So I said five in order to exaggerate. Anyway, the outcome of this process the, the, the best equilibrium that conveys any information of all is one in which if the state is one or two, you basically say it's low. It's either one or two. If the state is three, four, five, you say it's high. It's one of three, four, five. But there's no way to fully communicate the state in standard theory if the players are self-interested. Okay. So what happens? So this is, again, an icon graph that conveys a lot of data. I'm sorry, but let me walk you through it slowly. Each of these rows represents a state. State one, two, three, four, five. These are messages. This circle says that when the state was actually one, the message one was chosen most often. The circle is biggest. The size of the circle is the frequency of that, that state message pair. Uh, messages two and three were chosen pretty often. This person never exaggerates and says five. And what you see is these are level zeros. In this implementation of the cognitive hierarchy model, level zero means just tell the truth. Don't lie. And that's a common outcome. Level ones add one on. So for example, when the state is actually four, they say five. That's actually most common. And level twos add two on. Okay. So there's a tendency, again, the, the equilibrium theory is that if the state is one or two, you should see one or twos. That's not typically the case. And it's three or five, you should see three, four, fives. That's not typically the case. The behavior is a mixture of truth telling and then exaggeration. These are, again, this is a lookup uh, icon graph. The width of each rectangle is the number of times they looked at that number, that payoff number. The height is the normalized amount of looking time, total uh, fixation time. And what you see is that when the state is one, they mostly look at how much they'd get if the they sent message one, how much they'd get if they sent message two. The state is three, they look at three and four and so forth. So this, this is the aggregate pattern that, again, matches what you saw before. I'm going to come back to this game uh, later. That's why I was telling you about it. OK. Now, I'm going to show you, a, a, in kind of rapid fire, some fMRI results. All of these are subject to the usual kinds of critique. I see these as simply beginning to explore what, what areas of interest may be part of a circuitry that's doing these different steps of reasoning. And some of these, like our first study a few years ago, was really kind of sloppy. And we've learned a lot since then about how to do better work. OK, so first, we, we studied some dominant solvable games. That means games that have a special structure where there's a strategy that's worse for you than another strategy no matter what. You should never pick it. That's like picking a very high number in the two-thirds of the average game. You'll never win. You can do better. If you eliminate those, that often then makes some strategies dominated. If you eliminate those and so forth. Dominant solvable means iterated application of um, iterated dominance will lead you to a unique choice that's the best one. OK. And in the contrast, what I'm showing you is regions that are more active in this experiment, they sometimes choose what to play. They sometimes state what they think others will play. That's a, stating a belief. And they sometimes state what they think others think they will play. That's a second order belief. I'm going to ignore that until later. And when they're out of equilibrium, that means, I'm sorry, the, the contrast that's used here, the GLM, to generate these um, regions of interest is um, activity when they're choosing a strategy on their own versus guessing what others do. Okay, and remember, a level one player, when they guess what others do, is doing no processing at all. Everyone's equally likely. 
So you'd expect to see a lot more brain activity in choosing relative to believing if you're doing low levels of reasoning. The high level of reasoning players need to really think carefully about what another player will choose in order to do their own choice, and there may be much more convergence in the regions, which means we'll see less activity. So sure enough, when they're in equilibrium, that means that their belief about what others will do is correct. They've correctly guessed what others do, and their second order belief is correct. The only difference between choosing task and the guessing task is in ventral striatum. And that actually makes a lot of sense because the paths when they choose are different than the paths when they guess. We didn't, we didn't work very hard to equalize them. So this may just be a value signal or some kind of a prediction error signal. And when they're out of equilibrium, there's more activity choosing than in guessing in dorsolateral PFC, which activates everything, in posterior and anterior cingulate, and in an area called uh, John Allman calls frontal insula. Um, again, I don't attach, in, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk, a lot of significance to where these regions are, although they're familiar areas in, co in higher order cognition and reward. Um, but they suggest that, that when people are choosing, they're doing something different than whether, when people are guessing what others are doing, they're not doing the same thing as when they choose on their own. Okay. Here's a second study from Corselli and Nagel, which really nails things down much more nicely. This is in P coming out in PNAS soon. So they went really right after this cognitive hierarchy model, can we see steps of reasoning in the brain? And what they used was this beauty contest game, two-thirds of the average game that I mentioned at the start, except they varied the number P. So we looked at P of two-thirds, which is here. They varied P from one-eighth to 1.75. And the subjects play a series of these games with different values of P, sometimes against a person. Sometimes they're told you're playing a computer that just chooses at random. So the computer case is kind of like a, you know, just a natural control for reasoning about human cognition versus mathematical calculation. And um, what you see is some of the subjects can be classified as level one. They basically just pick P times 50. They act like they're playing a random, that other people are randomizing and they're maximizing against them. So this is the number of choices for all the possible p-values. They're pretty close to just p times 50. Okay. Then there are level twos, which are shown here. They're basically pretty close to p times p times 50. They act like they're people who are playing level one players who think they're playing random players. So this is just behavior so far. Uh, the first contrast is what's going on when they're playing humans versus computers across all subjects. And what you see is, again, a nice, very nice... Um, uh, circuit of lots of familiar regions in these types of tasks, uh, some that you've heard a lot about today from Peter and Hilke, uh, and also from Tim. There's a singulate. In, in this picture, it looks like it's corpus callosum, but it's a singulate. Here's the um, paracingulate region that Peter referred to, um, ventral um, medial PFC or medial OFC. This is the r bilateral right and left uh, temporal parietal junction that many people think is a important region as part of theory of mind. It may have some other, there's some controversy about that. In any case, when you're playing people in this game versus computers, you're seeing some differential activation and familiar reasons. Here's the closest we've come to nailing down cognitive hierarchy in the brain so far. They divide people by behavior, by be, the first graph I showed you, into people who seem to be choosing P times 50 versus people choosing P times P times 50. And then, the, so they divide first on behavior, and then they look at activity in the brain when they're playing humans relative to computers. And in the high level of reasoning players, you see a lot of extra activity in the parasingulate region. Again, fitting nicely with Peter's results. And this just shows you the um, contrast in the beta plots. And this is a, from a Tix paper. This shows it, the, the blue squares are mentalizing tasks. There's a lot of activity in these familiar reasons. So it looks like there's, there's a, a kind of neural correlate, um, as seen in many other games of doing two steps of reasoning, reasoning that another player may be um, playing, acting as if they're playing against a random player. And in the low level of reasoning subjects, you see just a little bit of activity in medial OFC. Okay. Importantly also, uh, they, they use this term that Megan Abet and I kind of coined called strategic IQ. That basically means how good at you are playing games in terms of your performance. And in this game, this is a funny graph, but a higher number me here means you're far away from the winning numbers. So you want to be low. Zero means you're winning every single time. And what they see is that as you have increasing strategic IQ, that is lower and lower numbers, you're further and further away from the target, you're closer and closer, there's uh, increasing activity in um, an area here of medial PFC. So again, this area was picked out by the contrast I showed you a minute ago, and there seems to be a correlation between this strategic IQ or performance level 
and activity in that region. Okay, this is the most complicated game. I'll try to zip through um, with the right trade-off of comprehension and speed. Um, a yard sale is a term that's used in the English for um, this. Actually, this is more like a flea market, slightly different. Um, a yard sale is when um, people have a bunch of junk in their garage and they want to sell it to other people. And they have two motives, which is to get rid of it. The, so the cost to the seller is essentially zero. They really don't need this stuff. Um, but they also want to make the most profit. So typically people set up these card tables and they come by. And if you're a buyer, you come by and say, well, you know, how about $5? And the seller's job is to, the seller would, like, would sell it for a dollar but they want to maximize profit. So the seller's job is to try to figure out how much you would really pay and either counter offer and say, well, okay, how about $8? Or maybe accept your offer of five or something like that. Okay. So in terms of the, the basic game theory structure here, the idea is that the seller has a cost of zero. They will sell for any number if they have to. The buyer has a value of V, which comes from a uniform distribution one to 10 integers. Okay. The buyer, so this is a game of private or asymmetric information. The buyer has a number the seller would like to know and does not. And the seller's going to try to make a guess from something the buyer does about what that number is. It's kind of like the states, the one to five states game I showed you before, strategic information transmission. So the buyer first gets their value V. They send a suggestion S, like, you know, how about six? I'll give you six for this ugly lampshade. The seller then gets the suggestion. They don't know the value V, they just know the suggestion. And they have to make a counteroffer of price P. And the trading is automatic and very swift. If, if the price P is below the actual value, the trade takes place. The seller gets P. This is a typo. I'm sorry. The buyer gets V minus P. It gets the surplus, the difference between the, the most they'd pay and the amount they pay. If the price is above the value, no deal takes place. They get nothing. OK? So this is, a, a, this is we, we struggle with this a lot. When we first started designing the study, we had all these complicated things. Those of you like Roger know a lot of game theory. There are many, many extremely complicated bargaining games you could pick. We kind of stripped it down to the most simplest thing that wouldn't be too trivial and which would be workable in imaging and, and some other, using other techniques. So the idea is that the buyer knows something the seller wants to know and the seller is trying to infer it from this suggestion. And importantly, in order to disable reputation effects, which complicate life a lot, We've studied those behaviorally quite a bit in the past, but wanted to avoid it here. They don't actually find out if the deals take place. So they're actually not getting any feedback. The task is kind of boring. They're just going through. That's important for what comes next. OK. So it turns out that you can classify the buyers into three clusters using a formal cluster analysis. By the information revelation, that's the, that's the, the slope of the regression of their suggestions against their values. So if I'm the kind of person when my value is 2, I say, well, how about uh, giving me a price of 1? When my value is 10, how about a price of 5? I'm revealing a lot of information with that pattern. That would be a high slope up here and a high R squared. So R squared is on the y-axis, how well the, this regression fits, and information revelation here. So the, the blues are truthful. These are people who reliably give a suggestion which is a good clue to what the true value is. The greens are uninformative. In fact, the game theory here predicts that no, you shouldn't reveal anything about your suggestion. The buyer should just ignore what you say and offer a price of either five or six to maximize expected profit. So the greens are people who have low, low R squareds, and typically the information revelation slope is around zero. The, the reds are the interesting ones, although notice they're the smallest group in number. There are 56 subjects here. This is a collaboration with Reed and Megan Abbott and Terry Lorenz, too. Reed and Montague, some of you know, in neurosciences at Baylor Medical school in Texas, they have big hair, big trucks, big guns, and big sample sizes in brain imaging. So, but that's, that's actually very helpful here, too, because in a way, we really want to study the individual variability and to do, rather than typical random effects analysis. So to do that, you just need a lot of subjects or some way of screening or generating healthy variability. So these red ones we call strategists. These guys are really clever. Um, again, they're few in number, but they're very interesting. They have a negative coefficient. They have a negative coefficient. And what it is is they do the opposite. When their value is really high, they send a low number, trying to get a really big profit. So if my value is 8, I might send, well, the most I can pay is 2. Because if you then name a price of, of 2, I've made 6 units of profit. Okay, But then why do I believe you? 
I believe you because when my value is two, if my value is two, I'm never going to make a lot of money anyway. So I say, oh, I'm willing to pay eight. And the strategists know that the buyers then say, oh, in that case, well, if you're willing to pay eight, I'll charge you eight. But the trade, they don't know if the trade actually takes place. We know, but they get no feedback. So the strategist is basically, here's an example here. Um, the strategist is choosing a series of suggestions over the last 30 trials of the game. They play 60 times, which have a frequency so that they sometimes pick really high ones and sometimes low ones. And in fact, this is a, this is a truth teller or an incrementalist. This is the actual distribution of suggestion, suggested prices from someone who's revealing a lot of information. What they're doing is when their value's high, they give a high suggestion. When their value's low, they give a low suggestion. The strategist does exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. When their value is high, they say low. When their value is low, they say high. But their profile looks exactly like this incrementalist. So if you're playing this game, it's like, wow, this guy sometimes you know, tells me the truth that this value is really high. Sometimes it's low, and I have to give him a break. And they're taking complete advantage of you. Okay. So they tie this to a cognitive hierarchy model. This, I, I, you don't have time, nor do you need to read all this information on the screen. The point is that the way to make sense of this is that the sellers think that there's some buyers who reveal information with a, with a ratio alpha. Alpha is sort of the, how much they, how truthful they are. If alpha is one, they just tell you the truth. If alpha is a half, they cut their value in half. And the level two buyers think they're playing sellers who are inferring alpha from this whole sequence of suggestions they see. Okay? So they're playing a strategist who sometimes says two, one, eight, four, three, two, and they think, well, this guy's giving me a lot of information about value. His alpha must be high. Therefore, I'm going to price very fairly. So the level two buyers, the strategists, think they're playing level one sellers who think they're playing level zero buyers and are Bayesian updating on the value of this alpha coefficient. Okay, and just one little piece of fMRI to show you. Um, this, is a, this is actually two slightly different contrasts. The bottom one is just um, strategists minus non-strategists at the time of decision, the time at which they send a suggestion. And you see activity in the retrosplenial cortex. This is um, a um, correlation of the, the slope coefficient of the information revelation regression, the regression of suggestion on value. And it picks out almost exactly the same region. What is retrosplenial cortex? Uh, Stan, close your ears. This is classic reverse inference. We didn't particularly expect this region, but it's here. So we can like not do anything or speculate. At this point, all we can do is speculate and then in, think about further tests that would be natural follow-ons. The retrosplenial cortex seems to be involved in episodic memory. Um, there's some lesion studies showing that you, you knock out um, different types of um, memory and learning in the region. Uh, also, early evidence suggested negative emotions. And the most compelling evidence from Eleanor McGuire and others is that it seems to have to do with cognitive mappings. So you show people films of a um, room they have to navigate and ask them to imagine navigating the room and you get activity in retrosplenial. Um, we're sort of, our group is kind of negotiating over uh, what we think is really going on here, what, how to write a paper and what to do next to really disentangle these explanations. I see these studies as really not having conclusions but having hypotheses for future studies you would like to do. And interestingly, this is um, this and a couple of other regions, the precuneus and Coleman, are the, there's only three or four regions activated more strongly by strategist thinking versus non-strategist. There are a lot of areas that are activated positively by information revelation. When more information is being revealed, there's dorsolateral PFC, cingulate, caudate, and we haven't figured out uh, what, what that means here. Okay, finally, a couple of applications and conclusions. So... Um, uh, again, my, my perspective, as I hope you've sensed, is that I started as an economist thinking about them, these mathematical constructs and things like equilibrium concepts, and we're trying to drill down to learn more about the mechanisms that are actually instantiating this behavior at, at the, the neural level in order to understand the economics better and to be able to then do practical things. So one thing we study is economic value. That means could you, if you created an artificial subject who used the cognitive hierarchy model to play games with other humans, would they do better or worse? The amount better that they would do, if it's positive, is a measure of sort of economic value of theories. A second thing I'll talk about in a minute is inferring private information, and I have a, a paper which I love to talk about, but just doesn't, it has nothing to do with neuroscience and it's no time today, on moviegoers' reactions to cold openings. The simple idea there is just this, which is, in the U.S., about in our sample, which is all major movies in the last six years, 
about 10% of the movies are not shown to critics in time for the critics to publish a review. Are they good movies or bad movies? They're bad movies, as judged by critics and by moviegoers who went and saw them. The critics and moviegoers actually agreed to a substantial extent, like a correlation of 0.8. Then, what, then if, if the studios realize that people know that unreviewed movies probably are bad, why don't they just let them get reviewed? The answer, we think, is that they think they're fooling some of the moviegoers who think, oh, there was no review. Well, I don't think that means anything. And this can be fit into, again, a cognitive hierarchy model in which some percentage of the moviegoers consuming the critic information are not making the correct inference that no review is bad news. And that actually fits the field data pretty well. You, it turns out that um, that helps you explain some things in box office uh, reactions. Uh, the example I will tell you a little about, remember the exaggeration game or bullshit game? That's where states one to five are observed by a sender. The sender sends a message. The receiver gets the message, doesn't know the state, has to figure out how much exaggeration was going on. Um, we can ask the following question. Suppose you use the lookups of the senders. We know what they look at. We know, for example, that if the state is four, they look at the payoffs associated with state four a lot. And pupilometry. Could we then say, gee, based on what they were looking at, the true state is four, even though they said five. And then we, we, we didn't actually do this in the experiment. It's an after-the-fact ex post exercise. And then we say, if I was a subject forecasting the true state from what the other person looked at, and from their pupil dilation at the time at which they announced the message, could I make more money? The actual earnings the subjects have is 85.5. The maximum they could get if they completely told each other the truth is 109.1. Using this mechanism, the kind of cognitively aided amount you could earn is 92.5, which is halfway between. So using these data, you could get halfway from where the subjects actually are to essentially the maximum possible earnings. Now, we don't know something very interesting, which is if you were a sender, and you knew that what you were looking at on the screen was being measured and recorded and used as information, do you then deliberately look away? It might this is very much like lie detection and other things, right? It might turn out that if you deliberately look away, the way in which you look away actually gives you away, and you can't really protect yourself. So we don't know. These are things that we can study later. Okay, so to conclude, um, what I've laid out today is what's called the cognitive hierarchy approach. There's a lot of gory detail. Quite a few people are working on this in various ways. And I tried to show you four types of data. Again, I apologize. I wish there was more neuroscience here to talk about, which is not very far along. Um, there's data from lab experiments, um, like this one, data from uh, field experiments run by newspapers, data from a field data set that had no experimental component, but we recreated it in the lab in Sweden, and um, a little bit of imaging data. Uh, there are lots of open questions. Are there distinct types in the brain? You know, are people born level twos? Almost surely not. We do seem to find some kind of persistence of individual differences if you have people play a whole battery of games. You know, how, they, how you, they're classified on the first 10 games correlates modestly with how they're classified in the last 10. Probably it has a lot to do with general intelligence and working memory as well. Um, we'd like to know a lot more about the natural thing is to link these to theory of mind regions like parasingulate and TPJ, uh, having to do with beliefs, intentions, and attributions. Um, in the area of disorders, you can think of lots of disorders which have, as a, part of the symptomology, something that having to do with strategic thinking, either paranoia, you know, mistakenly thinking people have ill will, gullibility, not being paranoid enough, and um, we heard a little bit uh, earlier about um, the role of social reward and um, social learning in autism, in at least HFA, that uh, Angela talked about. And finally, the opposite, in economics, we're interested not just in things that are broken, but things that are terrific. So. You could easily imagine studying, you know, expert poker players and things like that to see, you know, what happens when people are highly experienced and extremely good, at the very high up in the cognitive hierarchy. That's something we haven't specifically attacked. It's an obvious thing to do. And I have a lot of collaborators who did all the work. Thank you. I could not refrain from asking a question which might also be addressed to the previous talk. Uh, in uh, assuming that subjects make these high-level hierarchical models, um, this involves extremely, increasingly complicated representations. And so sometimes it is not a surprise to see areas like mesial prefrontal cortex or anterior cingulate that are associated with cognitive effort. I was wondering if any of your experiments were separating theory of mind from effort which could occur outside of the domain of mentalizing. Sure, sure. Well, most of the studies, and also there are a few studies, um, Peter mentioned some, like um, 
uh, Gallagher and McCabe. Um, there are a few studies that I, I haven't I left off because they weren't as tightly linked to this idea of steps of reasoning in a parametric way. Most of the studies do have these computer, you're playing a computer control task. It, it's true, I don't think any study has varied the complexity of the computer's algorithm, which in some ways would be the, the most, really the cleanest control. You know, you're playing a computer that's using randomly, you're playing a computer that's playing, thinks it's playing humans using randomly and something like that. Um, I think, you know, probably a, a, a lot of what you would see, for example, if we just did these types of tasks and you look at activity, a lot of it is going to have to do with just general mental effort, representation of maintenance. Um, and how much of it is kind of special to playing other people and maybe varies with the nature of the other people would be very interesting to study. And, and also, um, you could well imagine that these processes are sensitive to who it is you're playing. If, you're play if I'm told in a two-thirds of the average game you're playing a person with a PhD in game theory, your representation of their skill is different, and that, that should sh generate differences. Other question? Yes. Tim. Uh, so, again, I'm not sure if this is a question for you or for Peter, but maybe you can answer it between you. So, if um, it's hard, it's for Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, in Peter's uh, study, he has activation of dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and in the posterior SDS, and you have it in the temporal parietal junction, uh, it's in a similar place. In, uh, in various studies of theory of mind, like for, in Rebecca Sachs's work, for example, it is that TPJ region that is encoding the, the belief state of others, rather than just the fact that you're playing against other people and not the dorsal medial region. But yet in your work and in my work and here, that DMPFC is doing that. But in Peter's study, I'm sorry if it's a complicated question, in Peter's study, the TPJ region is always coding for the most complex thing, even in subjects who won't go on to use that. But the DMPFC is telling you what the subject will eventually do. So, firstly, what does the TPJ region do? Is, does the TPJ always code for the most sophisticated strategy, even in subjects that won't use that in your, in your study? And if so, isn't that a bit amazing? Or anyway, so what does a TPJ do is a simple version of that question. Um, well, it's true in the Corselli Nagel paper, which I was not, I, actually, I, I had a chance to work with them on it. I just didn't think it would work as cleanly as it did. Otherwise, I would have participated. Um, so it's their study, which I, I like very much. Yes, you're right. They, they find that both uh, bilateral TPJ, Sachs, I think, is arguing the right TPJ may have some extra special role. In, in all subjects playing um, uh, humans versus computers. Um, I don't recall in their paper, maybe it's in supplemental material or something, whether, it's, whether that general activation is entirely due to the higher level subjects or not. It may be that the higher level activity is so strong that it's coming across in random effects. Um, there's also some work you probably know by Jason Mitchell and others, I think, arguing that you also get similar activity in tasks having nothing to do with human cognition in reorienting, sort of in uh, Posner tasks. Which, and that suggests that either thinking about other people's beliefs requires some sort of fundamental reorientation, or, you know, obviously there are many to one mappings as well as in what these areas do. Um, in your task, you don't have something, something like uh, John and Peter have, where you have people that aren't going to use a high, uh, high level strategy nevertheless maintaining a representation of that high-level strategy in their brain somewhere, which is particularly intriguing from, from Peter and John's study. Yeah, in, in, in most of the studies I showed here, keep in mind, there's no, there's no actual feedback. Uh, okay. And the reason is that w the, most of these studies wanted to isolate just the pure reasoning process, knowing you're playing a person versus a computer under some, with some kind of other conditions. It, and basically, it's not that the strategic, the social learning isn't interesting. It's too interesting. We've, at this point, we felt it was a Pandora's box. There's too much stuff going on. Um, um, but obviously, you, you know, model adjustment and social learning and influence value are super interesting things. That's, I don't know if that's next on the agenda because it's still kind of intimidating. But in uh, Peter's task on the um, worker shirk type game, they, you know, they are playing each time and getting feedback. Uh, and it may be that that these regions are then unusually active in the process of model, form, model formation and model updating, uh, which we're probably just not seeing in the studies with no feedback. So they're, they're you know, maybe two entirely different paradigms, really. Okay. 
think uh, just before we go to the next speaker, I have maybe two, two comments. That, uh, the first one is that the um, uh, normal form game associated with the garage sale uh, experiment uh, is somewhat simpler than what you would do if you were describing the bazaar in Marrakech. Well, people do it a number of times, I suppose. The uh, uh, second point is, is only a, a personal remark. I, I, I have been involved in the two sort of the mean game, I will tell you maybe uh, later. Oh, oh. but um, it's called the beauty contest game. And I think it's, uh, I, I tend to believe that it's a, uh, uh, wrong uh, appellation, uh, uh, wrong word for describing what it is, because I think the beauty contest game of Keynes has not this structure at all, at least of my opinion. But uh, well, you invented it, didn't you? No, I did not invent no? the game, but I, I taught this game to, to Rosemary Rose Nagel. Right, right. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, actually, um, well, briefly on that point. So, yeah, the, I didn't have a chance to put the passage up, but in Keynes, he has a very famous passage where he says the stock market is like a beauty contest in which people are anticipating what others think the value of companies is and, anti and anticipating what others think others anticipate and so forth. And the, the reason we, we use that term was that Keynes doesn't specifically talk about timing, but clearly I think he has in mind a dynamic model in which the goal is to sell at a time when others haven't decided to sell yet, which is the role of, for example, you can do the beauty contest game where P equals one, so that everyone wants to be as close to the average as possible. And that sort of also falls with yeah. the class. I, I, it's quite, no, I think that the Keynes beauty contest is rather correspond not to two thirds but to one. Everybody wants to do the, uh, to, to, to give something that is cl closer to the mean, and it has a very different structure. Right, right. But Correct. That's, uh, yes. Yeah. Your point is terminology. Well uh, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> actually, we, to be fair, we we call it the P beauty contest game. Yeah. In order <laughs> in order to 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 sort of titrate, calibrate across P, that the structures really are quite different. Um, but it's kind of an ugly term. Okay. Thank you very much.